Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Iowa Farmers Market Association board today as we offer our annual workshop to you as a virtual experience. This is Donna and we hope you benefit from the four workshop sessions. Please submit any questions that you have to our website, iowafarmersmarkets.org, that's iafarmersmarkets.org, or to Marie Boyd. Her email is marie at healthyharvestni.com. Grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and get ready to prepare for market season 2021. Well, thank you everybody for joining us this morning. I've just got the okay that we are on on and live. So we are ready to go. I'm, my name is uh, Josh Dansdill. I work for Northeast Iowa rc and I am a moderator here today. I am also a board member of the Iowa Farmers Market Association. So I want to thank you all for joining us today virtually and all of our speakers that we have here today. We all wish we could have been meeting in person like we have traditionally done in February for the past many years. As of so many other events that have been going on across the country, we have gone virtual for COVID reasons. And we are, this is the last of a four part series from the Iowa Farmers Market Association. All other series that were broadcast the last few weeks are all available on the Iowa Farmers Market Association Facebook page and YouTube channel. So I encourage you all to go back and check those out. Uh, today, yet yeah, we're here with a great number of experts from across the state and I will let them introduce themselves as we get going here. I wanted a little housekeeping here. If anyone has any questions during one of the presenters presentations, please write them in the chat and I will be following those and relay those on to everyone else. So as we get started, uh, we'll have uh, uh, Dr. Shannon Coleman start us off here this morning. So good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here to give an update on farmers market resources that we have at Iowa State University. So who am I? Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am Shannon Coleman. I am an assistant professor and state extension specialist in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition at Iowa State University. My extension work focuses on food safety and local foods. Um, and so today I'll be giving you an overview of our resources that we have at Iowa State. So I'll go over our trainings that we have available and then our digital resources, um, which, are, which are our fact sheets and infographics and our video series. So for our training, um, we are currently doing the Produce Safety Alliance Produce Safety Rules training virtually. There is one actually scheduled for next week. Um, it's a little too late to um, register for that one, but um, just get in contact with our safe produce team. And if you would like to take a virtual training, there are plenty that are going on within the North Central region that you can join to get certified with that one. Um, the good agricultural practice um, training is online and also located on the safe produce team's website. And then the farmer's market training is already a pre-recorded training that is online. And then the training that I am in charge of is the Home-Based Food Operators Regulation and Food Safety course. It is also available online. Um, I have a fact sheet that I shared with Paul and Paul is going to um, post it up for everybody so you have um, hot links that take you straight to these trainings. So the Home-Based Food Operators training is available online or if you would like to have that training for your group in person, um, please contact me and I can get my team together and we can actually come and do it in person by request. As far as our digital resources goes, um, here are some examples of the different infographics and fact sheets that we have available on our extension store. Um, those direct links to these different um, <clears throat> fact sheets are on that um, resource sheet that I'm um, giving to, that Paul is going to post. Um, all of them are free. So um, make sure that you share this at your markets meetings, um, especially when you're getting ready to open your markets for the season. And then my little baby that Paul has supported, and I'm so happy to have Paul, um, <laughs> has been our video series that we've been doing with the Safe Produce team. So we have uh, moved all our videos over to YouTube. We have a produce safety playlist 
on the ISU Human, Human Extension Outreach website. So that link there will take you straight to our playlist and we have videos on um, agriculture water, best practices as far as getting ready for your on-farm readiness review, um, cl um, cleaning and sanitizing your walk-in coolers, pest um, management, as well as um, field contaminants. So all different resources that are available for growers um, as they get ready for their upcoming grower season. And those are our resources. So here is my email information and my phone number. Even though some days I do work remotely, my phone is attached to an app on my laptop. So you can call me and I will call you back. Some people have been very surprised that I can call them back. And I'm saying, I'm talking to you through the internet. So um, call me if you have any questions or concerns. And I look forward to getting ready for the next market season. And have a good day. I'll take any questions at this time. Okay, well, at this time, it doesn't look like we have any questions. I'm sure Shannon is always available for more. So we thank her for her time today. And we'll jump over to uh, Paul. And I did have you muted, Paul. I had muted everybody. I forgot to say that. Uh, I muted everybody as they joined just so we can listen to the presenter. So okay. as the uh, presenters come up, if you could unmute yourself, that would be okay. good. Okay. Thanks, Josh. And thanks, Shannon. I know Shannon's got to go teach a class, so she's off. And I appreciate her taking the time to, to share those resources. And those videos are, are very well done. Shannon's taken the lead on producing those for, for safety, food safety practices on the farm for growers. So you market managers out there, don't hesitate to share those links with your growers. They're, they're really educational, well done. So I'm going to try and share my screen here. So I've got a few slides up here. Um, here we go. I just want to give you a recap on the a couple of things going on at the Iowa Department of Agriculture. I'll, I'll give you a brief recap of the Farmers Market Nutrition Program and, and look forward to the, the uh, 2021 season. Uh, touch on COVID-19 and where we are and, and, and what the crystal ball might foretell, and then do some other in-house resources, touch on those. So when it comes to the Farmer's Market Nutrition Program, looking back at 2020, I just thought I'd give you a recap on that, and it, it may be no surprise to anyone that redemption was down, and that was true nationwide. We just, you know, largely attributable to the pandemic. We did have 370,000 plus dollars available from the USDA for food dollars for the WIC program. And out of all the, those dollars, 193,000 in checks were utilized. So about 52% of the available food dollars were transferred from the WIC recipients to the producers, largely at farmer's markets throughout Iowa. So down significantly from 2019, where you can see there that we had um, over three fourths of the food dollars utilized in that year. So um, down there and on the senior side of things, not quite as bad, but down again as well. $284,000 were utilized out of a little over $474,000 that were made available um, from uh, the USDA. Uh, so that's about a 60% utilization rate compared to 82% in 2019. Uh, this last year, the seniors were mailed their checks by the, by the state's six area agencies on aging and they struggled to get those out to the seniors. It, it was um, using lists from the prior year. And so it was harder for new individuals to get those checks. So uh, serving those checks, that was down as well as just hesitation to go out to the markets and use the checks, I'm sure. Looking forward to 2021, gosh, I wanna be 
optimistic, and I guess I'm guardedly optimistic that things will improve. Folks that are 65 and older are getting their shots now, and and I, I would think and hope by June 1 that most of those have got both doses where needed for, for their vaccinations, and we've moved on to other groups getting vaccinations. I think I'm not alone in that we're all hopeful that we'll see more normalcy coming, and it may be in steps, but I would like to think that uh, along those lines that, that redemption will go up for these programs. As far as what will be awarded or provided by the USDA for 2021, it will be about the same dollar amount for both programs, a little over 474,000 for the seniors and 370,000 plus for the, the WIC folks. For producers, we're hosting seven training events through uh, webinars, and two of those are all also offered at extension offices throughout the state. We just hosted one this month. We've got two in March, two in April, one in May, and then one in June. And that next line there shows you where you can find that training schedule on the IDOLS website. For market managers, the market assurance statements have been sent out. If you don't remember that, um, you could look for an email from me back in January, or we can send it to you again. But hopefully you've received those um, for completion. And then I thought I'd touch briefly on COVID-19. Um, currently, and this is through March 7th, the governor has a proclamation in place. And nothing in that is mandated. It's, it's a proclamation that when it comes to uh, situations like farmers markets, it just strongly encourages organizers to ensure the health of participants. So thinking about social distancing and increased hygiene practices, nothing in there mandating mask usage. Um, going forward, I will continue to do alerts as needed. Um, uh, if, if, if I had to look in the crystal ball, I would say this probably won't change, but who knows, you know, if trends go back up for infection rates, it, that, and then it would be very likely that the governor would put out a stronger proclamation, more than like we saw last year, um, where masks might be mandated and six-foot spacing, those kinds of things. But, but I still want to be optimistic that this is maybe what we'll see. Now, uh, markets take their own steps on what they wanna do for best practices. So uh, go ahead and of course encourage um, social practices that reduce the risk of COVID-19 and I know you all will. Um, we do have some resources on our homepage for specialty crop producers and farmers markets when it comes to uh, COVID-19. And you can go right to the homepage and click on a link there to look at those resources. Um, when it comes to the farmers market nutrition program, we did have a couple of uh, uh, things that we relaxed last year. We might do that this year, but, but I, it's too soon to say. Last year, we did allow producers to accept the vouchers on their grow sites, um, in addition to uh, the attendance of farmers markets. I, I have a hunch that one will go by the wayside. Um, and then we mailed checks to the seniors, and I'm, I'm hoping that they will come in person and pick those up for 2021. We did receive some CARES Act dollars from the federal government, and you can see that uh, we did were able to provide some dollars to schools for the purchase of produce and supplies that would help them. Um, and that helps some producers throughout the state reach out and, and connect with schools with these dollars. And then finally, I just wanted to point out that we do have something on our website called Field Watch or the Iowa Sensitive Crops Registry. And producers can go on there and self-register and it's a visual, they can show where their crops are and then commercial pesticide applicators 
can log in and see where those sites are, where they're going to be spraying in that area. It's a, it's a way of communicating where these crops that are sensitive to the pesticides exist out in Iowa. So it's a great resource for the producers. And I encourage everybody to go there and, and put their sites on there. We have an organics program. We have the farm to school program. All of these have website resources, including the farmer's market nutrition program, farmer's markets in general, the online directory of farmer's markets. Then we have experts and resources within our dairy bureau, our weights and measures bureau when it comes to scales and uh, meat and poultry. And that's my segue to asking Janice to speak a bit. Janice is with the Iowa Department of Agriculture's Meat and Poultry Bureau and, and fields questions and helps folks that want to sell uh, meat and, and those kinds of products at our farmer's markets. So with that, Janice, I'll give it to you. Okay, I have unmuted. I'm going to put up a screen here. Okay, so Paul, I'm going to do that. I should put I should put this picture up. That's my uh, oh shoot, get everything sit here. Um, as I was telling them earlier, uh, my son has a meat goat project for 4-H, and we welcome we welcome goats, some babies on one of the coldest days of the year, but they're doing fine. I just wanted to put my contact information up so everybody has it. I'm not gonna go into my full spiel about meat and poultry inspection. Many of you have already heard that. The biggest thing that I did want to, um, uh, just a moment, um, did want to talk about is um, really with meat and poultry inspection, nothing has really changed as far as any rules or regulations. Products still must come from an inspected source, bear, bear the mark of inspection to be sold at farmer's markets. Um, those licenses come through um, with Kurt Reber and inspections and appeals, who will talk after me or in Paul. And then, um, but some questions have come up recently. The first one that I would like to address is, um, we get a lot of questions about poultry. Um, it's one of those uh, uh, products that we have a lot of producers want to sell them at farmers markets um, and such. There is only one officially inspected poultry plant currently in the state of Iowa, and that's Marzian's Farm up in Green, Iowa. Um, as far as we know, it will open this spring. Um, and if you have people that are wanting to do poultry, you will need to um, that's where I would direct them to, to that. Um, if you have other um, uh, poultry producers that have questions, have them give me a call um, or email me their questions and such so that um, uh, we can help them out with maybe some other avenues of marketing their products. Um, also, uh, CIS program is the Cooperative Interstate Shipment Program that we started a year ago. Um, that allows plants to produce products under a little bit different um, regulatory system, not a lot different, but um, they are able to be state inspected and ship product across state lines like federal plants. Currently, there are two slaughter plants and five processing only plants under the CIS program. Um, with COVID, um, that has slowed down a little bit because of the whole influx of custom exempt processing, the not for sale where the products return to the owner for their own personal use. Um, the plants are, are, are overwhelmed um, with that type of work. So that brings me to farmers markets. Um, we have been also overwhelmed with calls um, from livestock and poultry producers on, I want to sell my product either from a farm store, a farmer's market, somewhere along those lines, and the rules still apply, and that that has to be done at, if you're going to resell the finished product, it must be done at an officially inspected plant. Um, and there's a few other little nuances like nutritional information, the complete label, if they're making claims on product, all has to be pre-approved through the plant on claims. Um, but it's just been overwhelming. Um, we just had a supervisor's meeting yesterday, and usually we have a new plant every other month, maybe 
if that um, we have a list of over probably 24 potential new plants opening in the next year and some are just right around the corner majority of them are custom exempt plants and they may go official um, unfortunately there are no poultry plants um, but we hope that maybe somebody will come forward and open one um, for those that are interested in poultry. But our biggest thing is that I think as farmer market managers or you as participants in farmer markets, you will see an influx of um, meat and poultry uh, produ or livestock producers wanting to sell the products from the, those livestock at farmer's markets. So being sure that they understand the rules, the regulations um, for doing so. Feel free to give my name and number out um, like I said, I'm fielding calls every day about it, and we just want to be sure everybody's doing it correctly um, along those lines. So that's just kind of the update I have for meat and poultry. So I'll turn it back to you, Paul, and then we'll answer questions if anybody has them at the end. Thanks, Janice. Appreciate that. So yeah, I, um, I believe Kurt Ruber is on, on the phone with us today. And Kurt is with the Iowa Department of Inspections and Appeals. Many of you know him, and he's our go-to guy for um, issues with licensing of, of producers that might want to sell particular items at farmers markets and the nuances between um, sales from the home, from the farmers market, from a farm stand down at the corner, and now uh, virtually is another wrinkle in all this is that really picked up during 2020, um, as well as licensing, you know, for, for particular uh, processed goods. Um, so Kurt, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here, Paul, thank you. Great, and maybe we could just start this off by you uh, talking a bit, you feel free to enter, you know, and flesh out your, who you are, but but then maybe go into the different nuances with sales between markets and online and and at the at the farm, the back door, so to speak. Sure, happy to do it. Um, you know, I might just start with kind of a big picture overview. In that, you know, really, it's fair to say that, except for uh, raw agricultural commodities and specifically produce. Uh, those commodities, if they're uncut, unprocessed, and just simply harvested, washed, packaged, and labeled, those can be distributed as far as uh, Department of Inspections and uh, Appeals is concerned. Those can be distributed, you know, however you want because they're, they're a raw agricultural commodity. But once you stick a knife in an apple or chuck the ear of sweet corn, it becomes what's considered in the law a processed food. And many of those processed foods, if they're shelf stable, can be sold from the home to the end consumer or from a farmer market booth to your farmer market booth uh, uh, to the household consumer. But anywhere else, it would have to be uh, further processed under a license with our department for uh, licensed accordingly. And, you know, so the, the exemptions in the law, written in the law, chapter 137F is the law, and then we administer rules for complying with the law under chapter 30 and 31 with our department. So the law, clearly exempts shelf stable non temperature controlled foods that can be sold at farmer markets but essentially it's limited to only farmer markets and you know trade shows and and craft fairs and uh, food vendor fairs and all those things are not considered farmer markets uh, so we kind of consider a farmer market to be two or more farmers who gather on a routine basis to uh, sell their goods. Uh, doesn't always have to be food related. We got some clarification from the governor's office this sp or last spring when COVID hit that, you know, farmer making cuckoo clocks or quilts or some of those type other things are, are you know, they're still farmers selling their goods and 
and I guess uh, we can consider those farmer markets that can then invite some of these other non-regulated foods in to sell. But to set up a table in the mall and put a sign on it that says, I'm my own farmer's market, that, <laughs> that, uh, that doesn't cut it. So um, with all that being said, uh, we last year we really struggled with everybody wanting to do, uh, you know, remote or, or what, I'm, I'm in a loss for terminology here, but, but they wanted to uh, have a gathering point where everyone could drop off their home, unregulated homemade items and then have volunteers or other people assemble packages for delivery or shipment or curbside pickup. And further in the law, it says that it has to be kind of a, the transfer has to, uh, or that's certainly the way it's interpreted, that the transfer has to take place from the producer to the uh, consumer. And so if you start assembling these bulk drop-offs for someone to assemble into a care package for curbside pickup or shipment or delivery, you lose that face-to-face -face interaction between the producer and the consumer, and it falls outside the allowance for unregulated food distribution. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Uh, we struggled with that last year, and our management took a, a hard look at it, and because it's written in the law, we don't have... Uh, the Bureau does not have the discretion to just waive those requirements. And I know that uh, was frustrating to a lot of people, but kind of fair to say our hands were tied and that we have to enforce the law the way the lawmakers write it. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I'm, I welcome any questions about that. Hopefully, like Paul said, hopefully going forward, we're gonna see more in-person foot traffic and, and actual farmer markets like we have historically enjoyed, but uh, but yet the precedent now has been set for some of these new ways of distributing goods. And I just want everybody to kind of know that um, kind of how the Department of Inspections and Appeals views those and, and uh, it really does have to be limited to a farmer market for for distri uh, distribution of those unlicensed foods. Does that make sense to everybody? <laughs> so just um, to play, oh, go ahead, Tammy. Oh, sorry. I just want to clarify. So you're saying, um, so, okay, for instance, we ran an online market last year. Um, but we are in the Iowa City Farmers Market. That's okay, but that we, you couldn't just, you know, somebody set up an online market without having, I guess, been established as such. Is that what you're saying, or well, should we? We don't care how the money uh, changes hands. So if the sale is done online and all the organization is done online, that's that's fine. But the the actual distribution, the transfer of the food uh, has to be in person, either from the vendor's home or from their booth at a farmer market. Did that answer the question, Tammy? Well, I guess I'm wondering <laughs> if we did this correctly or not now. <laughs> um, so we would have the farmers deliver their goods to you know, at two locations, depending on temperature control. And then we would put the orders together. And then on Saturday, people would schedule a time to come through and pick up their orders. And so it was, you know, our staff and um, volunteers, and then a couple of vendors that were present, you know, handing those out or putting them in their vehicles. So it sounds like Technically, we should not do that. 
Well, if, and we're talking about unlicensed food here. Mm -hmm. So produce, right. produce, of course, we would have no problem with the whole uncut produce. But what we're talking about is a homemade bread and cookies and fudge and all I those gotcha. kinds of things. And so, yeah, if the, if the farmer is there volunteering in your booth and helping with that handoff to the curbside customer that comes up, I don't think we have any problem with that, the farmer or their representative, you know, uh, but there has to be someone knowledgeable to answer questions and, and uh, you know, to just, to just drop off a pickup or a van full of, of cookies, homemade cookies, and then have you uh, put a package of cookie in 20 different handbags and then have some volunteers uh, transfer it off to a curbside pickup. That, that really isn't in compliance with the exemption in the law. Wow. <laughs> So that's even baked goods that are not, um, that don't require licensing. That's so like, correct. That's what we're talking about. Now, wow. any temperature controlled food, that would have to be produced in a licensed commercial kitchen. And then mm -hmm. there would have to be a, a license issued at the farmer market. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a little bit different because that food has been produced under regulation and, and the booth at your your uh, welcome center or whatever it is at the farmer market where you're doing that, that would be under license also. So everything's under license and that changes the whole ability to ship and deliver and all mm -hmm. those things. Okay. It's, it's, this is very specific to the unlicensed food. Right. So just to be specific, I just want to clarify that I understand this. We have a vendor that brought baked goods to us every Friday. Um, we then volunteers, staff would get the order of a, a customer. We might take, you know, those baked goods that she's left. We've sorted them on a table. So now we're going to take those baked goods. And we're going to put them in the order or in the sack from the person who ordered. And then the following day, we, again, staff and volunteers are going to put those in a vehicle. We should not have been doing that. Is that what you're saying? Not with I the... Think Yes, I, I think the way you laid that out, that, that would not be in compliance with the exemptions. Okay, that, yeah. so, so we now, should have, now, ha we should have had the, the, um, the vendor should have been there. Well, the vendor should have been there and it should also be uh, classified as a, a farmer market. So when you said that you load them up were you delivering them? Because clearly that would not be a farmer market. You know, no. if you- if No, you we are, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, please go ahead. We are a farmer's market and we held the on, or the drive-through was in the same location as our regular farmer's market would normally have been held. And so the customer scheduled a time to drive through. The I far, the, so we're still a farmer's, it was still run by the farmer's market. That all sounds real good, but if the if the producer or their designee were to be in your booth as a uh, as a help, then we can make the connection that the if the customer has questions or or doesn't like what they see or whatever the case may be that that uh, you know the the producer has a representative there. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. It's you're you're not alone. I, I might add. I mean, that's why I, I thought it was maybe important to bring up. It will time will tell if we'll see a repeat of probably not to that same magnitude. I, mm -hmm. I suppose. But yeah, a lot of people met met that with uh, frustration, and especially when uh, you know they counted on all that throughout the year. They a lot of times they plan for that. I had a lot of people that had massive gardens built and and then when all of a sudden the farmer market season was very much in question, they're all wanting to know what they can do to can or, or acidify mm -hmm. or or dry or do something with their produce. And so it, it was a it was a strange year, but I thought it was worth bringing up here. Uh, help get the word out so that nobody winds up 
getting in a jam. <laughs> yeah. So we what? are we are opening back up as open air market, but the the group that we had partnered with is going to run an online farmers market. So it sounds like they maybe need to work yeah, with no, you a little bit. Could I add a piggyback be. question on there, Kurt? Because sure. someone had asked this in the chat. So for that baker in this situation, what steps would they need to do to make that situation that Tammy just described um, yeah, I'm, legal? Thanks for, thanks for the question. And I was gonna try to get there. <laughs> okay. But uh, also last year, we saw a huge increase in applications for home bakeries. Now home bakeries are defined in our Iowa Administrative Code chapter 34. And if you review that, one page, I, th I think it's just one page document that essentially is the inspection report. And so as you can see, we that's the one and only license that DIA offers for a home family kitchen. And it's limited to baked goods only. Baked goods are also defined. Uh, it doesn't mean that they, in the end, the baked good can require refrigeration for food safety, such as a sour cream raisin pie or something, but it has been baked. And that's the key to know it, the baked goods are, are defined as such things as breads and cookies and cupcakes and those type things. But fudge, for example, is not a baked good. So you can make fudge and sell it at a farmer market without a license because it's a shelf stable food, but it is not a food that can be produced for commercial sale in a home bakery because it's not a baked good. You gotta really kind of consider what it is. Is it baked in pumpkin pie? You can top with, uh, with uh, frosting or something, cream cheese that does require refrigeration but the good itself was baked. I see some heads nodding. I hope that makes sense. Um, so an online group, Kurt, would they, right now they're kind of restricted to just packaging fruits and vegetables straight out of the garden and, and those could be delivered to drive through people? Yes, or anybody that's producing their food in a licensed kitchen. Okay. And, you know, I, I might add to that, uh, throughout the years, uh, CSAs have come into question because a lot of times those include farm fresh eggs that have not been run through an egg handler license and, and cookies and all those type things. And those are fine from your booth at a farmer market, but, but it's not okay to deliver them or meet at the Walmart parking lot or ship them because those are not face-to-face -face at a farmer market or from your home. They're synonymous with each other, the direct sales from your home or your booth at a farmer market. It started off, as I understand the history of that, started off from your home and then they extended your booth at the farmer market to be the same meaning as from your front door. And so anybody that wants to do uh, vend at craft shows or uh, county fairs or any of those type things, because they are not farmer markets, all those goods have to be produced in a licensed commercial kitchen. Now, over in your Iowa City area, uh, uh, there there has been a uh, organizer, I guess, that has combined a craft show with a farmer market. After he understood all the that the exemptions only applied to farmer market, they were doing a craft show one day and a farmer market the next, or some such combination. And so he just combined the two together and it made everybody. Um, that sounds like our market, actually. Oh, maybe. maybe. <laughs> I don't know. We've always had um, crafters and artists at our market, along well, with the produce. Yeah, of course, uh, crafters are are not regulated by us anyway. We're, right. We're sure. So one thing, one way, I, like I, I would give the 
downtown Des Moines farmers market as an example. You know, later on in the season of 2020, they they started up a drive-through market where you could place orders online, but then the 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 products you selected were handed to you by the vendor or a representative of that vendor at the market, and that that seemed to work well. And and, and instead yeah. of having it packaged and handed by by a volunteer. Yeah, that sounds like it works. I, I think up in North Central Iowa last year, they had a, a situation where they wanted to reduce the foot traffic through the market. So they actually still had vendors there, but as an option, they allowed uh, the curbside pickup from the main welcome booth. And, uh, and we didn't have a problem with that because the vendors were still there. They might have been off behind the welcome booth, but but they would, you know, they, they were still there and represented and, and maybe running goods back and forth from the booth up to the welcome center, that, that kind of thing. So, so we, we, oh, go ahead, Paul. So, so somebody from the welcome center, a volunteer could then in that situation, hand it to a car or a person. That I, I think that, uh, I think that we uh, have gone along with that last year because the vendor is still there. And nowhere in the law okay. does it say that the that the vendor, <laughs> you know, we we try to really uh, enforce the law as written. And and if the vendor is there, and and has their own booth set up, and you're just trying to limit traffic by having a a centralized table, yeah, I think we can live with that. That's good to know. Okay, good. It's when the vendor drops off everything at the welcome center and then goes back home that, that you know, okay. we were really, really running into issues with. And then the CSAs, everybody wanted to do a bunch of shipping. And you get into these jams and jellies and some of the more exotic things that people are able to do. Um, you know, it's, uh, we, we do deal with, with uh, potential concerns with, and, as more of these foods are produced. You know, uh, every fall I get questions about uh, dehydrating or freeze drying apple chips and kale chips and all those kind of things. And it's very important that they're dried down far enough in order to avoid any potential public health concern. And, uh, and our field test for that is if it's brittle. But if you, you know, if you just drop all that stuff off and, and redistribute it at will, you, you lose an awful lot of accountability. You know? Kurt, this is Janice. I just want to clarify what we're talking about are people that are making stuff that are exempt, meaning they don't have a, to have a license to make those products that they must be present versus somebody that's doing it, such as meat and poultry products that bear mark of inspection. Those would be okay to drop off and the vendor wouldn't have to be present. Well, that's correct. Anything that is coming from a licensed facility would be would be fine to ship out or deliver, do whatever you want with. Yeah, we're we're only talking about the exempt foods that that the exemption uh, is uh, created for farmer markets. Thank you, Kurt. Tammy, did you have any other maybe examples or something that? But, no, I think uh, I think you said this at the beginning of your talk, and I just want to make sure I understood it. Um, <clears throat> produce is, is exempt. So does that mean that those vendors need to be there too, or they do not, did you say? No, they, they do not. Okay, so that's what I thought. Yeah, if they're exempt from uh, any regulation, Honey would be another example. Pure honey in Iowa is completely unregulated. And so honey and unprocessed produce, uh, I, I can't think of really anything else that would, would be classified as exempt, but those two categories certainly are. But if they're flavoring the honey, um, for commercial sales, they have to be licensed with us for because it's not pure honey. And the only thing exempt from regulation is pure honey. 
Okay, but the baked good vendor who is exempt that should be there present. Yes, they need okay. to be there. Or, or uh, you know, it's 50 bucks a year for a home bakery license. And I don't know that it, it'd be a rare occurrence if they were, if they uh, have denied any. Now, I'm not firsthand working in that uh, retail food uh, any longer, but, but essentially they come in, it's more of an educational thing. They ask for some minimum labeling requirements. They, uh, ensure that you don't have any pets and and uh, those type things they talk it, it's much more about education talk about the importance of um, date marking or holding foods for for a limited amount of time and temperature of safe storage of food and all that kind of thing you know and for 50 bucks then uh, anything that qualified as a baked good, as it's defined in the law, then they can sell up to $35,000 a year, mm -hmm. kind of wherever, however they want, because they're licensed and approved for doing so. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we've seen an awful lot of that over the past year, and so have other states, you know. So. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, Kurt, that you heard a lot about in 2020 that you think, you know, a lot of well, questions? That... A lot of questions about, you know, preserving food and, you know, uh, canning. I just really have to take those calls on a case-by-case -case basis because there, there's, for example, there's four ways to wind up with an acid-controlled food. You can either acidify it, which has to comply with a very stringent regulation. You can ferment it, which is exempt from the acidification regulation, provided certain conditions are met. If you allow it to ferment down to a, a pH of below 4.6, most operations will then choose whether to refrigerate it at that point to stop the fermentation or drain off the fermenting brine and replace it with acid. Uh, but if it's allowed to ferment far enough and then you replace it with acid, such as vinegar, uh, that's still considered a fermented food that would not have to comply with, with acidified food regulation. Uh, and then the, the last one is uh, acid foods, such as a ketchup, that you blend a little bit of dry spice with it, you recook it to blend the flavors and you hot bottle it. Uh, we consider that an acid food. And, and then I've got, of course, you've got your natural acid foods, such as a lemon or, you know, strawberries. Those are known to be high enough in acid, low enough in pH that uh, they're what's called a natural acid food or, or an acid food. So anyway, I, I didn't want to get in the weeds too far on that, but those are the type conversations I've been having quite a bit with vendors who, you know, just want to further add value and, and add uh, shelf life or preserve their abundant produce. Uh, due to the lack of farmer market outlets. But, you know, their produce could be taken to any of the, any of the retail restaurants, grocery stores, wherever, um, as long as it's whole uncut produce. I see a question from Jane, but before we get there, um, along those lines, would you say that microgreens are fresh produce and oh, I'm glad you asked Paul quite a few questions sold at a about, farmer's market you bet microgreens are considered produce as long as the root or seed is not intact if the root is intact it's considered a sprout and sprout all sprout production must be licensed with our department inspections and appeals for you know just due to the inherent dangers of consuming sprouts and the foodborne outbreaks that have been associated with them. But if you cut it above the substrate or the ground level or whatever your growing media is, if you cut it, uh, then what you have in your hand is produce. <laughs> okay. 
Now, once you start chopping up the produce, uh, then it depends on what the produce is, whether or not it requires temperature control. Let me, let me say there are two, two ways to go down that path. Once you have the produce in your hand and it's been cut off, you bag it up, you can, you can distribute that as a raw agricultural commodity wherever you want. But if you start cutting it up, and you can do some of that for sale at a farmer market, depending on if the end product requires temperature control, but you wouldn't be allowed to do any of that for distribution on the other commercial markets, such as a restaurant or something. Does that make sense? You can harvest carrots and cut the carrots up, put them in a bag and sell them at a farmer market, but you couldn't sell them at the restaurant unless your production, your processing site was licensed. Again, it comes back to the exemption in the law for shelf stable foods, and that is specific only to farmer markets. The same is really true with, uh, with ear, ear of sweet corn is another decent example. You can husk the ear of sweet corn and, and, and package it up and sell it at a farmer market because it does not require that the temperature be controlled for safety. You might want it controlled for quality, but it's not a safety issue. But if you husk the sweet corn and take it to Fairway, you've just applied a process that would have to be licensed at your farm for husking the sweet corn. Oftentimes the farmer will deliver the, the whole era sweet corn and they'll do the husking in the back of the high V or the Walmart and then uh, and it, so they take care of that and it is done under license. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah it, I you know I try to uh, you know I guess lawmakers had to draw the line somewhere. Uh, right. We, we deal with that in Iowa, and it's also dealt with on the national level, the difference between USDA and FDA, and especially when it comes to egg products. You know, they, an open face sandwich is a USDA regulated food, and a closed face sandwich is an FDA regulated food. So they, again, they had to draw the line somewhere, and it's never going to please everybody. Uh -huh. uh, Well, thank you for that. I just, I've been getting a few calls about microgreens, so I figured you had some insights on. Yeah, the big thing with, with all produce, well, and then of course, uh, Paul would be the contact. There comes a point when, when you're uh, growing and producing produce that uh, there comes a point where the produce safety rule does come into play on larger operations. And that would be uh, Paul that would, screen those questions and, and help navigate through that. Uh, but just for, for our sake, just let me reiterate, if, you, if you're not cutting into the edible portion of the produce, it's a raw agricultural commodity. Okay. And if, if the root is intact, uh, it's a sprout and that all sprout operations, no matter the size, must be licensed with us. But a, but a raw agricultural commodity, you're free to do whatever you want. I, I use the example of, of uh, beets. You know, you can harvest the beet, cut the root off, and sell two raw agricultural commodities. You got the beet green and you got the beet root uh, because it's been, the green was harvested from the root. But okay. you start chopping up the beet green and now you're limited to only farmer market sales unless you become licensed. Tammy, is that making sense? <laughs> okay. Paul, that was really good. I'm glad you reminded me of that. Is there anything else? That... Well, I think Josh, there's a, you can jump in there. Yeah, there's just one other question we had here from Jane. She said uh, that they have a producer uh, that brings baked goods occasionally to sell. And do they need a home bakery license? I would assume that this is probably an in-person sale at the farmer's market. Jane, you could hop in if I said that incorrectly. Um, yes, um, it's they, 
it was like the beginning of the season, the, the, he sells, you know, corn, vegetables, but didn't have a lot of product um, at the beginning. So was bringing baked goods. So well, would he need uh, a license then, a home license? Well, if he's got a booth and it at your farmer market, and of course we're talking about a farmer market here, uh, yes. if the baked if the baked goods are shelf stable, uh, yes, he can do that without any licensing at home. But if the baked goods, once in a while, take a cinnamon roll, for example, if the cinnamon roll by itself is shelf stable, but if they start making a homemade cream cheese frosting that's put on the cinnamon roll, then we don't know if the cream cheese frosting requires refrigeration or not. And so in those cases, we would ask that the cream cheese frosting have an active water test done on it and simply simply done up at Iowa State or Eurofins in Des Moines. And if the active water content for the cream cheese frosting is below 0.85, then he could do that and uh, take it all down the farmer market and sell it. But, but uh, it all depends on if it requires temperature control for safety. We have a downtown Des Moines, uh, you've got a coffee vendor that, that gets a license with us every year because he, uh, his customers want real cream and real milk offered for his uh, coffee booth. And just coffee itself, if he used imitation coffee creamers, he wouldn't have to have a license with us, but his Customers want the real thing, and real milk products require temperature control, so that's why he's required to have a license. Okay, thanks. Yeah. That active water test is also what's needed if uh, you got kale chips or apple chips that are dehydrated. Uh, like 0.85 is the threshold or below. And just let me give you just a 101 on active water. The, the lab, uh, scientific symbol is capital A underscore W. And it, active water is the, the water that's available for microbial consumption. Bacteria are just like us. If you, they have to have proper temperature, food, and moisture to survive. If you control one of those, you can control the bacteria. And science tells us that water activity below 0.85 is sufficient to tie up the water molecule so that the pathogen cannot consume it. That's what keeps beef jerky safe at shelf stable and crackers and, and all these other goods, you know. Uh, a drop of water equals one. And the more you tie up the water molecule with salt or sugar or other preservatives, the less is available for the bacteria to get to and actually consume. And, and that's the measure that we need. Uh, the, our field test for it is if it's brittle, like bacon. If you can snap the bacon, we consider it shelf stable. Cooked bacon, a lot of people don't realize, but if, if cooked bacon does not require temperature control. So a person could fry up a bunch of bacon at home take it to the farmer market, and that's a shelf-stable product. No if limp bacon. Uh, pardon me? No limp bacon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, so that test, I, I, too bad Dr. Coleman wasn't still here. I think I've had people tell me it's like 20 or $30, and, and you wouldn't have to test every batch. We just want a, a, a sample of what you're selling, I encourage people like in dehydrators, they're so finicky, you have to keep rotating shelves and the slices of apples and kale chips and all that vary so much. So try to pick out your thicker piece pieces and uh, send them up to Iowa State. It's a quick test and, and then you'll know if it's below 0.85, go to the market with that. If the inspector ever questions you, you've, you've got the document right there, you know. And just a periodical test, if, uh, if you're close to the 0.85, they might ask for more frequent testing. But usually people are 
are below to the point where it's not even not even questionable. You know. Well, great. Looks like our hours up, Josh. But boy, that was that was good, informative stuff. And well, and you know, uh, maybe uh, hopefully you all got my contact information. I. Uh, I'm, I, it's what I do. I take these calls, help people navigate through this and, and help in any way I can to try to get them set up. Uh, so welcome frequent contact. Great. And I'm sure we'll get those posted. I think Josh will help get us that done. And I want to thank Josh for all the organizing of these four sessions and getting them up and posted and hosting this live one too. That's really appreciated. Pleasure. Yeah, we'll be sure to have all the links for all the presenters on here and on the Facebook page for the Iowa Farmers Market Association and get that out to everybody when it's, when it's up. Thank you for attending the Iowa Farmers Market Association virtual conference. Remember Iowa Farm Bureau sponsored bags that are available to our membership. Please consider becoming a member. For only $20, you can provide safety to your market customers by requesting the new bags for vendors to use. Visit our website for more information. The sessions will be available on our website so you can refer to them or point someone to them. Thank you and have a great 2021 market season.